Hi everyone, my name is Elaine, and today I'm going to be both summarizing and reviewing the 13th novel in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, Small Gods, starting with the summary. An eagle drops a tortoise from up high. The history monks live high up in the mountains near the hub of the Discworld. Their job is to organize time and to both record and observe history properly. Lutze, a senior monk, is sent to Omnia. Some important historical events are supposed to take place there. The eighth prophet of the Church of the Great God Om is expected to appear soon. Brother, the Chosen One, hears a voice while tending to the Temple Gardens. He flees. Pratchett reminds his readers that Discworld gods grow with a power of belief. He writes, There are billions of gods in the world. Most of them are too small to see and never get worshipped. They are the small gods, the spirits of places where two ant trails cross, the gods of microclimates down between the grassroots. And most of them stay that way, because what they lack is belief. That's on page 7. Brother speaks to Brother Numrod, a novice master, about the voice. Brother Numrod talks about the two voices one might hear, the voice of a god when one becomes a prophet, and voices of temptation. The pair doubt Brother is a prophet and settle for the theory that Brother heard a more common voice. Forbus is the head of the Quisition, whose job it was to do all those things that needed to be done and which other people would rather not do. That's on page 13. He feels as though he knows his destiny because God himself had informed him. Brother returns to Ho in the Melons. Forbus oversees the torture of his former secretary, Brother Sasho, who is being punished for spying on him and betraying the church. Brother begins hearing the voice again. After a time, he realizes that it's coming telepathically from a one-eyed tortoise with a chipped shell, suggesting it's the tortoise from the novel's first few pages. The tortoise introduces himself as the great god Om. Brother doesn't believe him. He had expected him to be an eagle, lion, or bull because of the statue in the great temple. Om wants Brother to fetch the high priest. Brother says he'll see what he can do. Brother fetches Brother Numrod. A dozen figures meet in a cave. They want to kill Vorbis, send someone to a Phoebe to save the master, to Dactylos, and hopefully bring him in the book back. The group draws lots. Brother leads Brother Numrod to Om. Numrod can't hear Om speak and believes Brother to be an overly enthusiastic novice. Brother Numrod doesn't believe the tortoise is a god and shepherds Om to the kitchens to be turned into soup. Brother rescues Om. He begins to believe that Om is a demon. Om makes a very small black cloud appear above Brother's head and a very small bolt of lightning singe his eyebrow. Om asks whether or not Brother believes he's Om now. Brother still seems to have his doubts. Om explains that he isn't quite himself. He had intended on being a bull, but had wound up a tortoise for three years. Upon further discussion, Brother realizes that Om can't remember most of the things he was said to have said and done. That the prophets were just men who wrote things down that it wasn't from Om. That's on page 52. Om thinks some of it might have been. He has forgotten a lot over the course of the last few years. Om begins to share some of Brother's memories, shocking him. Brother faints at the sight of Vorbis. Vorbis places Om on his back. Vorbis speaks to Brother Numrod about Brother and discovers that the novice is loyal, devout, illiterate, but in possession of a good memory. Vorbis wants Brother to be sent to him when he recovers. Om is in his own hell, baking in the sun, convinced he was the one who had frightened his believer by sharing his memories. Om fears that he's going to die because you died if you had no believers. You also died if you died. That's on page 59. Lutze flips Om back over before returning to his work. Sergeant Simony receives a message from the Turtle Movement, the secret society who met in the cave. He's being sent to retrieve Didactylos from Ephibi. Om goes in search of the high priest, also known as the Cenobiarch. Om gets kicked around a lot on his journey and notices the eagle take to the sky. Brother meets with Vorbis and two of his associates, a fat man and a stocky man. They quiz Brother on his memory. Vorbis informs Brother that he is to report to the Gate of Horns at dawn tomorrow, and you will come with me to Ephibi. We are going to discuss political matters with the tyrant. That's on page 74. Vorbis also informs Brother that he is to forget about their meeting. Brother agrees even though he doesn't understand. Om calls for Brother. Brother informs Lutze that he's going away for a while. He tells him how to tend to the plants in the garden. Brother hears the voice of Om calling for help. Brother rescues Om from the eagle and other dangers. Brother informs Om that he's going to a Phoebe with Vorbis on a mission to the infidels. That's on page 87. Om asks to be taken to a Phoebe. Brother agrees to bring him along. Om realizes that Brother is the only person who truly believes in him. General Fryat had learned about the turtle and felt it right. He decides he wants to kill Vorbis when Vorbis strides into his room with a pair of inquisitors. A group of men prepare to leave for a Phoebe. Vorbis informs him that Fryat won't be joining them. Death comes for Fryat. Fryat discovers that he has to walk a desert alone. Brother, Vorbis, and company set out on their journey. Om wants Brother to kill Vorbis for turning him over in the sun. Brother is extremely hesitant to obey. He also continues to doubt that Om is really Om. Brother asks Om to change his shape in order to prove his identity. Om says he can't and asserts that he's not just a tortoise who thinks he's a god. That's on page 114. Om fears Brother finding out the truth behind his weakness. It'll be the end of him. Om also fears the novice's death. After surviving a storm, the captain of their ship tells Brother to fetch Vorbis. Brother informs Vorbis that something's shining in the desert on page 125. Brother is instructed to use the captain's mirror to shine the sun toward the desert and tell him what he sees. Brother counts the flashes of light off the desert for Vorbis. The captain informs Brother that the world is flat and has an edge, that the turtle moves. That's on page 130. 
Brother speaks to Om about it. Om says that the world isn't a ball as Brother had always believed, but flat and on the back of a giant turtle. Brother goes to report to Vorbis. Brother informs Vorbis that there were six flashes and then a pause of about five heartbeats, and then eight flashes, and another pause, and two flashes. That was on 134. Vorbis says something about three quarters and praising the god before dismissing Brother. The travelers arrive in Ephibi. They are met by a group of soldiers, which causes Om to question the Ephibians' desire for peace. The Omnians are escorted through the city into the palace. Upon arrival, Brother realizes that he wants to learn more about Ephibi. Om realizes that he wasn't doing anything to Brother. Brother was doing it to himself. Brother was beginning to think in godly ways. Brother was starting to become a prophet. Om wished he had someone to talk to, someone who understood. That's on 147. The Omnians are shown to their rooms. Om asks Brother to find a philosopher to help him find a way to stop being a tortoise. Brother and Om leave the palace. They find a group of philosophers fighting in a tavern. Brother asks the philosophers about gods. Xena replies, we don't bother with gods. Relics of an outmoded belief system gods. That's on 154. The gods begin to make themselves known, and Xeno has to make some exceptions. Brother speaks to the barman next. He suggests that brothers try speaking to Didakalos, who may be found in the palace courtyard. Om reiterates that he's looking for a philosopher to help restore his power. If everyone believed in him, people wouldn't be able to talk to him and vice versa. Om wonders what has gone wrong. If other gods are being worshipped in Omnia. Brother doubts it. Brother and Om make their way back to the palace. The Omnian delegation is brought before the tyrant. He informs them that he's almost finished with the peace treaty, which they are there to sign. Om searches for the library. Peace negotiations between the parties don't go well. Om happens upon Didactylos and his nephew Urn by the library. The tyrant threatens Vorbis with more coastal raids and harassment of Omnian ships if they do not sign the treaty. They decide to reconvene the following morning. After the meeting, Brother wonders why he doesn't feel like anything is as it seems, why he knows what he heard isn't true. Brother is led back to his room. He discovers that Om is no longer there. Vorbis gives Brother permission to explore and learn about their surroundings. Brother finds Om, Urn, and Didactylos. He informs them that the tortoise is a god, but won't use Om's name. Brother learns that Didactylos wrote a book which claims the world is flat and travels through space on the back of a giant turtle. Brother asks Didactylos about the gods. He is invited into the library. Brother discovers that Didactylos is blind. Didactylos shows him several scrolls on gods and religion. Brother leaves the library. Om admits that no one believes. Brother is confused. Om explains belief shifts. People start out believing in the god and end up believing in the structure. That's on 191. Om asks Brother to become the next prophet. Brother doesn't believe anyone will listen to him. Vorbis confirms that there can be no truce with the Phoebe. Brother leads Vorbis through the palace and considers killing him. Vorbis stages a coup, usurping the tyrant's throne. A collection of Ephibian citizens, which includes the tyrant himself, is brought before him. Vorbis meets Didactylos, the man who wrote De Shalonian Mobile the book that claims that the world is flat and travels on the back of a giant turtle through space. After speaking with Vorbis, Didactylos claims to have seen the error of his ways and offers to write another book containing a full retraction. The philosopher begins to walk away, turns, and throws his lantern at Vorbis. It hits him in the head. Didactylos escapes. Vorbis sends his guards after him. Brother is ordered to lead a group of Omnians to the library. He and the rest of the party are meant to burn it. Sergeant Simony defends Didactylos from his pursuers. Didactylos and Urn argue about what books they should save from the library when the Omnians arrive. Simony and Brother save the Ephibians from the others, send them away. Simony announces that he is a friend who wants to help the Ephibians. He does not trust Brother. Brother admits that he can be of help too. It seems as though he intends on memorizing all the library's books before they're burnt in order to preserve them. Simony retrieves Om for Brother. Brother begins memorizing the library scrolls. The Ephibian library burns. Unseen University's librarian appears out of nowhere, shoves several scrolls in a sack, and disappears, adding them to the university's collection. Brother awakens to the smell of the sea. The library's books all safe and sound in his head. He notices that there are patches of fire all over Phoebe. Om informs him that everyone is fighting. Brother learns that Didactylos set fire to the library so Vorbis couldn't read the scrolls and become even worse with their knowledge. The philosophers, Brother, Om, and Simony begin to make their escape by boat. They plan to make their way to Ankh-Morpork. Simony suggests a return to Omnia to put Vorbis on trial. Brother agrees to speak out against the Quisition, against Vorbis for starting the war, after Didactylos is seen to safety. Vorbis searches the library's ashes and realizes there are no bones. He realizes those he pursues must have escaped by sea. Vorbis plans to take a group of men down to the docks in pursuit. The traveler's boat is becalmed. It's still within sight of the coast. Urn begins to work on a solution. Brother realizes the books are leaking out of his head, causing him to share information he learned but doesn't truly understand. A storm strikes. Om urges Brother to jump ship. Brother obeys. The unnamed boat Brother had been traveling on vanishes. Brother realizes he can't swim. The Fen of God, the ship Vorbis had been pursuing the escapees in, is caught by the storm. Death comes to collect his captain and sailors. The captain discovers that Vorbis survived the storm. He and his crew go in search of paradise. 
Brother and Om wash up on a shore surrounded by desert. Brother picks Om up and begins to make his way back to Omnia. Brother stumbles across Vorbis. He's unconscious. Brother decides to bring Vorbis back to Omnia so his actions can be exposed. Om is displeased and lets himself be left behind. Brother falls and lies still. Om goes after Brother. Brother gets up and continues his journey. Om stumbles across Brother and Vorbis. They're unconscious. He begins digging for water. Brother awakens and drinks some of the water Om gets for him. Brother inspects Vorbis. He has a fever. Brother gives him water. Brother still intends to bring Vorbis back to Omnia. Brother continues his journey. Vorbis hasn't woken up. The unnamed boat continues on, all its passengers intact. The boat goes ashore on a beach a few miles from where one of Simony's friends live. Simony and company continue into Omnia. Um leads Brother toward the water found in a lion's den. He wants Brother to use Vorbis as bait. Brother won't and begins to help the lion when he realizes it's been injured by a spear. Om um doesn't approve. Simony and company meet with some friends, turtle believers. Simony expects Didactylos to leave them. Brother and company follow the steps in the lion's den to an abandoned temple. Brother tries to work out a way to collect the water inside. Vorbis has awoken, but his mind seems vacant. Didactylos speaks to a crowd of turtle believers. He explains that great Atuin exists. There's no point in believing in things that exist. That's on 284. The crowd doesn't seem to get his point. Simony speaks to Urn. This wasn't what he had in mind. He says the people don't want philosophy. They want a reason to move against the church. That's on 285. He's muffed it. He could have done anything with them, and he just told them a lot of facts. You can't inspire people with facts. They need a cause. They need a symbol. That's on 286. Brother and company leave the temple. They come across tracks left by soldiers and follow them. They happen across a grave. Brother takes the fallen sword. The lion who had been tracking them digs up the grave to eat. The fighting had ended in Phoebe. The tyrant had been freed from prison and returned to his throne. He spent the day writing messages to other small coastal countries. Something had to be done about Omnia. Vorbis hits Brother over the head with a rock. He picks up the unconscious Brother and begins to head toward Omnia. Om does his best to follow. Brother awakens in the citadel after a week of lying unconscious. Numrod informs him that Vorbis is the eighth prophet and he may be promoted to the rank of bishop or yam for traveling through the desert with him. Numrod says that Brother was to be brought to Vorbis as soon as he was fully conscious. Brother is surprised that he's supposed to see Vorbis now. Brother is brought before Vorbis, who is also the new Cenobiarch. Vorbis raises Brother to the rank of archbishop and dismisses those around him so that he may talk to Brother privately. Vorbis explains that he led Brother through the desert of his soul and he, in turn, was led by his god. Vorbis claims to have learned a lot in the desert, things he needs to share with the world. Brother doubts his ability to act as Archbishop and realizes that Vorbis is afraid of him. Vorbis shows Brother the new torture device he created, an iron turtle. Brother is dismissed and told to rest. Brother learns that Vorbis will release his laws in the Book of Vorbis in a few days' time. He knows that Vorbis is both talking and listening to himself. Brother realizes that Om has spoken to him. Lutze watches Brother as a new archbishop tends to the garden. A man informs Vorbis that the turtle people are planning to use a machine to break down the temple's doors during the ceremony confirming Vorbis as Seno by Ark. Vorbis intends to be prepared. Brother speaks to Lutze. Lutze knows Brother talks to a god. Brother laments that he can no longer hear Om. Lutze instructs Brother to do what he must. He suggests Brother make up his own commandments. Didactylos is displeased with Ernst's construction of the Iron Turtle, which was designed to help overthrow a tyrant. Didactylos expects the machine to be destroyed after it serves its purpose along with its plans. Ern doesn't seem to want to do that. The temple begins to prepare for the inauguration of the Cenobiarch prophet. Ern reviews how to use the Iron Turtle with Simony. They begin to set their plan to attack the temple into motion. Ern and a hooded figure pop out of a hole in front of Brother. Ern saves Brother from an untimely demise. Ern tells Brother to stay out of trouble and that it's best if he doesn't know what's happening. Ern and the figure depart. Ern and Fergman, the hooded figure, make their way through the citadel. As the ceremony goes on above them, they begin the process of opening the temple doors for Simony. Fergman and Ern are discovered. They neutralize the threat, but the door begins to open too soon. Ern suggests they depart. Simony is enraged the moving turtle won't move. Brother searches for a sign. The temple doors open. Brother walks into the temple. He realizes that nothing meant anything if Vorvis was prophet. Nothing meant anything if the Cenobiarch was a man who'd heard nothing in the inner space of his own head but his own thoughts. That's on pages 341 to 342. Brother raises his hand to strike Vorbis, but stops himself from doing so. Vorbis is enraged. The guards surrounding Vorbis capture Brother. Vorbis orders them to thrash him within an inch of his life and burn him the rest of the way. Now. That's on page 343. Om is picked up by an eagle during his travels. Brother is chained to the iron turtle. Om bites the eagle's testicles and forces it to fly him back to the citadel. Simony finds Ern in the crowd gathered in front of the temple. He informs him that the moving turtle did not work. Ern catches Simony up. Vorbis stopped the ceremony after Brother made him angry and had him chained to the iron turtle. Ern wants to to save him. Simony thinks it's hopeless and wants to allow Brother to die so he can be a martyr. Ern is disgusted. He feels as though Vorbis has turned Simony into someone like him. Simony reluctantly considers rushing in for the rescue. Brother speaks to Vorbis. He says Vorbis has never heard Om. Vorbis mocks him. He is sent by Ark and Brother is going to burn for heresy and treachery. Brother believes that there will be justice. Vorbis believes that his actions are justice. A speck appears in the sky. Brother announces that the god is coming, that Vorbis is going to die. The eagle drops Om. Om hits Vorbis between the eyes. The watchers start to believe with their hearts. 
Om becomes a great god who rises over the temple. Om frees Brother and names him both Cenobiarch and Prophet of Prophets. Brother bargains with Om, creating a constitutional religion for 100 years. After that time, it will be reviewed. Om informs Brother that a fleet of Phoebians, Sordians, and all the other free coastal countries approaches to stamp out Omnia. Brother doesn't want Om's help with the fleet. Brother picks Vorbis up and goes to beat the fleet. Simony and Urn go after him. Vorbis' shade is forced to walk the desert alone to judgment. Brother attempts to negotiate for peace with the opposing armies. He is met with defeat when Simony, Urn, and their army appear on the dunes behind him. Brother is frustrated with the turn of events. He no longer feels as though humans deserve gods. Tells Om to choose another chosen one. Brother leaves the site of the impending battle. Om storms into Dun Manifestin, where the Discworld gods live. He finds several gods peering over a miniature version of the world, watching the impending battle. Om knows people are going to die. When the Sordian god of Losan gives a remark which suggests he doesn't care, Om realizes that even though he has thousands, he needs to fight for one and hits the god over the head with a cornucopia. A storm strikes. Borvorius of Sort is convinced the gods are angry. The opposing armies begin to seek shelter. A couple of dice drop into the sand. Suddenly, the storm stops and the gods appear before the mortals. They inform everyone that this is not a game. And here and now, you are alive. That's on 378. It was over. Brother thinks Didactylos would make a good bishop. Brother wants him to come up with a better way of ruling Omnia. Brother appoints Simony head of the Quisition. He wants it stopped with as few deaths as possible. Urn is to tinker with things like irrigation, and Brother is to copy out the library. Then they're simply to carry on. Lutze leaves the citadel and returns to the hidden valley where the history monks live. He informs the abbot that all went well. Brother sees to the birth of the largest non-magical library in the world, which many people come to visit. 100 years after Brother's journey in the desert, he dies in unusual circumstances. Brother meets death in the desert, and Vorbis. Brother guides Vorbis through the desert to judgment. And that's the end of the novel. And now, for my book review. This novel had a lot going on. For me, it was a lot harder to follow than many of the novels which came early on in the Discworld series. I always felt like I was missing a little something or a little bit of something. The novel also included a few peculiar points, some of which I didn't mention in my summary. An example would be a meeting that didn't really take place between the meeting parties. It was meant to push the plot forward, but I simply found it confusing and it contributed to my sense that the novel was spontaneous and disorganized. The novel also contained details which simply didn't make sense. For example, Brother and Om followed the tracks left by soldiers through the desert. But the desert was windy. How did the prince remain intact? Why weren't they blown over with sand? I felt as though many of the novel's characters were bland. A prime example would be Om, who for the most part can only be described as bossy. He also doesn't grow much during the course of the novel. I would have liked to see more from Om and the other characters featured in Small Gods. I felt as though the novel was often redundant. For example, it mentioned that tortoises make for good eating frequently. I wasn't the biggest fan of all the philosophical and religious discussions which appeared in the book. It's just not my kind of thing. So overall, I gave this book a 2.9 out of 5 star rating. For me, this definitely wasn't Pratchett's best work. And there you have it, my summary and review of Terry Pratchett's Small Gods. Do you agree with what I had to say? Did I leave anything out? Let me know down below in the comments. I always like to know what you guys think. And if you like what you saw here today, smash that like button until it's blue. Subscribe, ring that bell so you know what's up, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye guys!